insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 130 marching band. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my musical and talented co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm all right. How about you? I'm doing good. Today, we are joined by special guests, the directors of Madison's marching band, Mr. John Porco and Amanda Lackis Porco. How are you guys doing? Good, good. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for joining us for this. Uh, I know we wanted to do this early on, and things have just been so crazy with uh, uh, the band and, and everything else. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to us today. Of course. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what marching band is. We'll explore what's involved as far as time commitments. We'll talk about what skills are honed in marching band, not all of which are musical. We'll also take a look at some of the less obvious benefits teens gain that will stay with them for a lifetime. Are we ready to get into it? Sure. All right, let's do this. All right, so let's first get to know our directors. So tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, what's your personal uh, marching band history? How long you've been involved? How long you've been directing? That sort of thing. So I'll get I'll get started. I've been involved for fifteen years in marching band performing and instructing. Uh, I went to Lenape High School so I was a you know fresh freshman just marching for the first time um, and then taught at Deptford as well as Apsigami High School. Um, I realized at the end of the season that I just wrapped up my 10th year directing, which is kind of crazy. Those years fly by. That is um, impressive. Yeah. I've been in the activity since uh, 2003. And I started instructing in 2009. Um, so since then, I have worked with uh, Cherokee High School, Absagami High School, um, and most recently, Denver High School, um, where I've been the assistant director, I guess, for three, three years now. Three years, yeah. Oh, that's great. That is great. So what do you guys do? Do you share the same duties? Do you handle different aspects of... Um, I don't know, the, the musical side, the creative side, can you kind of explain sort of what you guys are, are both responsible for? So this is, this is an ongoing work in progress for us <laughs> on sharing duties. Uh, we definitely have our own strengths. There's some things that we, we share and we kind of butt heads with, but, um, we always prevail with the, the greater one on top, but uh, generally I'm the music director. Amanda is our visual director. Um, we'll obviously cross over in those aspects. Occasionally, Amanda's obviously a music teacher. Um, I've done visual for many years, but uh, we try to you know stay, stay in our lane for the most part. And then administratively, we split up a lot of stuff. I mean, Amanda is the most organized human being I know. So I try to defer to her with as much as I can. I try to, I try to be organized, but she always uh, outdoes me. So um, we do split our duties pretty, pretty evenly. And, and, you know, I have to, I have to kind of speak a little from experience because I was there for the one practice and I got to see how you guys interacted with the band. And it was almost a synchronicity, the way that you guys, you know, as you were making corrections here and there, you have one person that was up in the booth, one person down on the field. And it was a very cooperative feel to it so it was very interesting definitely what, what motivated you guys to become band directors i would say it would be my experience in high school marching band um 
You know, there's so much to take out of that experience, not just, you know, as a musician, as a performer, but, you know, life skills, discipline, you know, the relationships that you build are um, really unique and special. Um, And I was inspired by my director um, who provided me that experience as a student. Um, I was really inspired to kind of, you know, explore what it might take to become a music educator. That's, that's actually a really interesting way to look at it. What, uh, obviously without giving away any trade secrets, what's the secret sauce? What do you guys have together that makes you different and, and makes your band special? I don't know if we figured that out yet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess something cool that we do at least is we design our own shows. I know a lot of, uh, programs will buy, you can buy like music, you could buy arrangements, you could buy drill. Um, but we try to keep everything in house. I think that's important because um, not saying we're like the most creative directors on the circuit. Like, I think there's a lot of really awesome directors that um, are creating some really cool shows out there. But um, when you're designing your own show, you're really designing it for the students that you have specifically. So you're able to kind of gauge throughout the spring and summer, you know, where everyone's at and what level you think that they can get to. And you could really max out each student to their abilities. Oh, that's great. That's great. What do you guys get out of it? What's the most enjoyment that you get out of, of out of directing bands? I would just say, you know, watching where the kids start um, in the beginning of year and where they can end and just, you know, to see that success repeated, you know, over and over again. Um, it brings us great joy because, you know, you're bringing, you're being very, very demanding, um, but you're asking for the best from these kids. And you know that, you know, you're building such um, an outstanding experience and outlet for them. It's a ton of work, but it makes it worth it. And it's, you know, why we keep coming back every year. And it's actually a great lead in for the next question is what kind of impact do you see marching band having on these members as a, as a parent of a, a new marching band member, I've seen non musical impacts. What kind of impacts do you guys see? Well, I think the most important thing that we like to look for in our programs is character. Um, we want to make sure that we're creating an environment where, you know, the students can just see on a regular basis, whether it's an instructor or, you know, a fellow marching band member of like how you want to present yourself every day. Um, and that goes, like you said, beyond music, beyond marching band, um, just a way that you carry yourself. And I think another big thing is like confidence. That's where you're going to see a lot of growth from. Um, your child, uh, when, if you have a, you know, child doing marching band, um, they're out there all the time. They are in situations like band camp and these competitions where, you know, you look back like 12 months and you probably would have never put yourself in that situation. But, um, the level of confidence that you gain through the activity is unbelievable. And that carries over for, for anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would definitely agree with that. I wasn't in band myself. My musical talent could probably fit into a thimble, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I was a choir boy, so I was in choir. But I there was a lot of kids that were in choir that were in marching band. And I knew from that that it was such a tight-knit group. And I didn't really appreciate that until we were exposed to it. And And it's even though it's a competitive environment as you go up against other bands – just the fact that we were coming back for the one competition and you had one band passing the other, wishing them good luck, go out there, you know, knock them dead, that sort of thing. And just that overall support and encouragement just blew me away. I've never seen anything like that in a competitive environment. And it was, it was really touching to see. Absolutely. It's a whole, it's a whole community, um, you know, and you see it between the students, but you also see it between um, you know, different programs and directors, you know, we have friends who do the same thing that we do with other schools. Um, and we couldn't be bigger fans and more supportive of each other. It's, it's a really cool uh, community to be a part of. Yeah. And I think that's probably the, the biggest benefit that I think I've seen so far. And Madison was fortunate enough to experience that early on because she kind of struggled early on there, didn't really uh, find her place right off the bat. And just the, the, the band members that stepped up and, and gave her that pat on the back or helped her get, you know, get over one of those uh, little problems she had. It was just fantastic to see the, the support all the way across the board. Totally. Yeah. Cause we, we try to tell the upperclassmen, uh, you know, you've been there, you've been a rookie. Yeah. Um, and those first couple months are the hardest. They really are. Um, it's, there's so much new stuff being thrown at you. 
Um, and I do, I think our upperclassmen this year did an outstanding job in being that support system um, for the rookies throughout the summer and fall. So do you guys, I'm that. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I said, I'm sure Madison can attest to that as well. <laughs> yeah. the that she was able to find. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So do you guys have former members come back after they graduate to keep in touch and help out and stuff? Yeah. I mean, any, pretty much any student that is going into the field of music, um, I stay in touch with. Um, I'm always there as a resource if they need help or, you know, any paperwork or anything that I can do to like make their lives easier. I'm there. Um, and then we have a lot of alumni coming and working for us. Uh, I mean, this past season, Brian was a graduate of mine. Um, but even before that, it seems like almost every year we have alumni coming back on and it's really, it's really cool to see them. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So Madison, you had a couple of questions to ask. Yep. Um, so the first one's kind of vague. Um, so what is marching band? What's involved? What should a new member just joining need to know? Kind of like the basics. It's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) So the style of marching band that we do here, um, is a competitive style. So a little bit more involved, a little bit more demanding, a little bit more athletic than, um, what other, some other programs might get into, but I guess the summary of it would be musicians and performers putting together a production on the field that is both, uh, musical and visual simultaneously. Okay. <laughs> sums it up right i think that doesn't give away any secrets with that answer <laughs> and the second part of your question madison um you said what would a new member need to know getting involved mm-hmm. okay um we say pretty much nothing yeah. actually you know we take have taken kids who have never played an instrument before um kids who are learning something new right off the bat um if you think about the color guard element of our um, of our group, you know, spinning the flags and different equipment. There's no outlet for that before marching band, you know, they didn't have a previous experience. They may have danced. Um, so that's a brand new experience. Most people don't have experience coming into, um, yeah, we've taught people instruments. We've switched people from one instrument to another instrument. Um, and while it certainly helps for kids to have a little bit of background in music, they learn a little bit quicker. Um, but we would never turn anybody down who wanted to be a part of what we've got going on here. That's I think great. that was great. I'm going to add just a quick thing outside of like, I mean, that, that was like the perfect answer, but, um, the big things we do look for is someone that has like a good work mm-hmm. ethic. Yeah. Um, okay. obviously you don't need the experience, but it is as Madison can attest to, it's a big time commitment. Um, and if you're there, you're ready to work, you're ready to better yourself every single moment of the day. Um, you're going to be extremely successful in this program. Um, and then, like I said, the other thing is just the time commitment, just understanding that, uh, you know, you're, you're working with us through the summer and fall. Um, a lot of people get surprised when the fall comes around. They're like, wow, like, I didn't know these competitions were calling this stuff. And <laughs> like, yeah, this is what, this is what we do this for, uh, these performances, these competitions. So, um, just want to sneak that in there. Okay. Fair enough. So how is marching band different from other band electives? I think what we talked about earlier, it's that family uh, vibe that takes place in marching band, which you kind of get in the other ensembles. But I think when you're around some people so much like you are in marching band, um, especially band camp where you're there Monday through Friday for 12 hours a day, um, you get to that weird feeling towards like your friends and stuff where you like hate them and you like love them. <laughs> at the same time and it's just, oh, like, so it's like family. <laughs> it really, yeah, you just like, you could like, want to like strangle someone and then wake up the next morning and you're just like best friends again. So, um, it's a really cool thing, um, in that sense. And then obviously the, the visual elements that Amanda was mentioning, um, this is such a great outlet for students that are interested in dance or even just like, you know, into like trying to advance themselves as dancers. Um, you can really get a lot out of this program that really isn't offered in really any other aspect of the school than maybe like theater or drama. Um, so that's a cool element that's added in. The one thing that I had, I did notice, and it was very obvious going to see the other competitions and seeing the other bands, and it was the, the diversity and the acceptance. 
It didn't matter what shape, what size, what color. You had kids that were out there that had disabilities that were able to get out there on the field and, and perform and be a part of something special. And it was just so nice. And it was a relief to be able to see that level of acceptance out there. It was very, very surprising, very enlightening. Yeah, it's awesome. And I think that's another thing with marching band. We Marching band is usually a custom like design, a custom experience. So we make it the show work for anyone who wants to be a part of it. Yeah, I think that's great. What else do we have? So let's discuss instruments. So what instruments typically make up a marching band? So um, marching band instruments are pretty much the same as the instruments that you would see in a concert band or wind ensemble. Um, however, there are a few um, instruments that are specific to marching band that are kind of modifications of instruments you might find in a concert band. Um, so you will find piccolos, flutes, clarinets, saxophones, um, trumpets, trombones, and tubas. Um, but a couple of unique instruments for marching band, um, instead of using a French horn, um, there are mellophones, which we didn't have a mellophone this year, but we might in the future. Um, and they're kind of like a bigger flared out trumpet that sound kind of like a French horn. Um, but you can carry it much better than you would be able to carry a French horn. That would really work. Um, and there are also, um, marching euphoniums and baritones that are typically, um, instruments that sit in your lap in a, in a concert band setting. So they have, um, you know, marching band versions of those instruments that um, work better on the field. And then the other big thing is the percussion section. I think uh, students that are involved in percussion, drums, all of that, um, marching band's a great outlet for them to explore so many more instruments than they would ever play um, in a concert band setting. So you obviously have the drum line, which is um, pitched basses. So you'll have generally anywhere between three and six bases that are pitched um, from high to low. And then you have snare drums, which are pretty common. They're a little modified um, for the marching band setting to cut um, all the way up to the box. Mm -hmm. And then we have the marching tenor drums, which is kind of like toms on a drum set, um, but obviously in one you know compact little unit that you can carry around. Uh, and then the final section is our front ensemble section, which has a whole bunch of different keyboard instruments, um, electronics, uh, color percussion. Sometimes in marching band, we just like invent things to make sounds because we need them. So, uh, well, you'll see a lot of weird stuff in that section. Is that the pit you're referring to there? The pit, yeah. We like to, front ensemble is like the fancy, fancy name for it, but uh, it is like the casual when you don't want to say the whole word. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about practices. So how often do they typically occur? So generally for our program, which again, it's different across the board. Everyone rehearses differently, um, but we'll do basically two practices a week during the summer. Um, generally we get started around 4th of July. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do like some pre stuff in the spring just to get, you know, students who are interested, but that's usually the start of our rehearsal season. Um, then, like I mentioned earlier, we have a band camp, which is crazy. And it's a whole week, 12 hour days. Um, but it's fun. We don't just rehearse the entire time. Uh, we do a lot of team building activities, eat some great band parent food and <laughs> weird skits. Um, and then during the fall, we'll keep that same two night a week schedule, but then you have your Friday night, uh, football games, which generally will stay after school, do sectionals. Um, and then Saturday is our competition day. So we'll probably come in like a couple hours early to get a little bit of a practice in before we head out to a competition. So I, the one thing that I did notice that struck me is, I don't know, I would, don't want to say ah, but it's a little surprising, was your practices were, were later than I expected them to be. Was there a reason for that? Yes. Uh, one of the reasons is for the students um, who want to be, you know, athletes as well as band members. So we have a number of students who are on, you know, soccer team, uh, field hockey team, who also participate in marching bands. So they're able to, you know, finish their practice eat, you know, wind down just a little bit and then head to marching band. Uh, the other thing is staff. That's, that's actually probably the biggest thing. Um, most of our staff members, and this kind of is across the board in, in all marching bands were, well, at least in our state, um, where the staff members are not working at the school during the day. Uh, we find, you know, former drum corps members, uh, you know, music majors or educators who maybe are teaching at the elementary, middle school level. Um, and 
you know, we need to wait for them to get off work. A lot of them don't get off work till like five or six o'clock. So uh, if we did an after school practice, it would pretty much be, I guess it would just be me. It'd just be you. Yeah. <laughs> that. That's a lot of, that's a lot of responsibility for that person. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes perfect sense then. Yep. What else do we have? So now let's talk a bit more about performances. So typically how often can members expect to perform? Ooh. Uh, um, so during the heavy part of our season, they can expect um, about two or three performances. A week. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's about right. Yeah. And that probably starts well, like, Usually like the end of September. Mid-September, end of September. And so like usually the first week in November. Mm-hmm. And then we'll tr- probably do a couple like parades and stuff during mm-hmm. the year. So there might be like a parade in the spring or summer or something. And those are always nice, different performances. Um, but generally, yeah, the competitive group, like Amanda said, like three times so a week. Is that sort of what the kids are get psyched up for is to go out and do these performances? Because I know... I played football and, and you tolerated practice just for game day. And <laughs> if game day wasn't there that week, you, you, you really, you, you couldn't get through practice that week. Generally that's, that's the vibe. I think this year, uh, the reason the kids did so well is because, um, our practices were generally really, really strong. Uh, you probably hear this from coaches all the time, but we like to preach, you know, you practice like you perform. Yeah. Um, yeah. and we just try to make sure that those practices uh, the kids are putting out that same level of intensity that they would for a competition. Um, but yeah, the, the big thing is the competition that they perform for. And the, the main one is our championship at the end of the season yeah. um, called the Atlantic Coast Championships. It's kind of the, the creme de la creme of competitions. Awesome. So speaking of competitions, roughly how many competitions are there in the season? So there's a lot on the schedule, right? There's probably like, um, yeah, so you can compete. I'm sorry. My dog's creeping in the bottom. Here. <laughs> um, I mean, you can start as early as the second week in September and certain circuits will go all the way up until, um, I know a circuit that just ended last weekend. Um, wow. so not the one that we were involved with. So, you know, you can pick and choose which, um, weekends you want to participate in. Um, you kind of have to schedule it for what's best for your program, how many times you want to go out that year, you know, pacing, you want to get a couple good Saturday, um, Saturdays without shows so that you can have really long rehearsals. Um, so we did four shows this year, five. <laughs> it's kind of all just like fly by. Usually yeah. it's like anywhere between four and six, mm-hmm. um, competitions for us. Um, but yeah, there are some bands that do a lot like there's some bands that do like two or three uh competitions a weekend not just performance double up and do a saturday sunday it can be it can get heavy at times that's crazy so we haven't really talked about a certain aspect of the band which is the color guard okay so what is the color guard and is it really a part of the marching band so if it's the musician's job to show what the story is by sound, the color guard's job is to represent that visually. Um, so anything that we are trying to portray um, within our theme is really going to be centered around the color guard. And they're going to do the storytelling for us. Um, and they are you know, absolutely a, a pivotal part of um the whole band it would be really hard to read a lot of the um theming that we do without um their level of performance so absolutely they are they are huge um so they do a number of things um they dance they spin flags they spin rifles uh sabers sometimes oddball equipment that we just come up with um that might fall into the theme like you know in the past we've used these like wooden lightning bolt kind Uh, of things and you know you'll see them doing all sorts of stuff out there um and they are they're truly talented performers it's a very unique skill set i'm always jealous of the guard i wish i got a chance to perform in a color guard before um yeah but they're super tough (laughs) that's the one thing it's It's crazy (laughs) i mean especially when the weather's getting colder like you're tossing these things like so many feet up in the air and you have to like just catch it and it's just mm-hmm. like it's painful sometimes it hits you in the head like and they just like yeah. keep on working through it yeah. um they're a very they're impressive tough. group yeah they're a nice 
especially like for like a rehearsal, it's always good to point out the color guard and be like, like, how come you're not working as hard as that? <laughs> <laughs> that was one thing that I had noticed going to all the competitions was the, the, how the story was depicted. You know, the color guard was basically the stage. They were, they were the actors on the stage. Yeah. And yeah. It was almost like everybody else was there to support them telling the story is what it seemed like. In some ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was really, really interesting to see, especially across the different bands to see some of the props that they had and some of the sure. outfits that were done. Um, the, the last game that we went to and it was exceptionally cold. We all had sympathy for the color guard for the outfits that they had because <laughs> it was very cold. <laughs> what was the last question we had for this one? So the last one is just basic. Like how long is marching band is a marching band season? It never it ends. It feels like it season. never ends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, what, two weeks out now, and, you know, him and I will be sitting on the couch watching TV and be like, well, what do you think about this theme for next year? What can we do? You know, yeah. what kind of songs could we, like, layer into So we never really stop. For us, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> this is, like, design season. Now. Yeah. Usually, usually this is when we, like, get the staff together. But this is, like, one of the rare years where all the staff members as of now are coming back. So yeah. um, it's oh, good. almost like a break for us, but yeah. yeah, then comes design season where you, you know, get the whole storyboard together. You do all the music arrangements. Um, and then we start some, there's usually a little bit of off season training. Um, okay. And it always depends on the group. We usually leave that up to the kids um, depending how, you know, how crazy they want to go that year. I've had groups, that started off season training in January. Wow. Uh, I started coming in like once a week and just like worked on visual and music stuff. Um, but then sometimes it doesn't start till May. So it all depends on what the student leadership wants to do. We don't want to, I never want to push them in that sense, just because um, you really want them to, to want it basically right. um, for that kind of thing. So yeah, it's kind of, it really doesn't, it doesn't stop. I never, <laughs> even when you're out you're never out right <laughs> well that was great that was i think that was that was all the questions we have for this segment we're going to take a quick break um and then we'll come back and we'll talk about what's required for marching band we'll be right back for over seven years the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about marching band with our guests, uh, Mr. John Porco and Miss Amanda Lackis Porco. Um, so now we're going to be talking about what's required for marching band. So I think uh, now's a good time to talk about uniforms. So are uniforms required for practice? So we usually only use the uniforms um, for performances. Um, in a couple of rare occasions when we're getting ready for some early performances, there may be times where we call for uh, students to wear their helmets or gloves just to get used to those different accessories. Um, but we typically will not use those during um, practice. We do have a practice uniform in the sense that we um, require students to wear athletic clothing, sneakers, things like that. We do have a little bit of a dress code um, for what is appropriate to wear to rehearsal. Okay. That's a good example, that uh, explanation. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, not doing too well with my English. <laughs> uh, so our next question is, how much time do kids need to put into marching band? 
Uh, so we require them to come to the rehearsal. So yeah, in the summer, it's six hours a week. Um, nothing too crazy. And then in the fall, that probably gets almost doubled, right? Mm-hmm. Probably 12 hours a week. Um, it's pretty similar to any uh, varsity sport, probably less than what the varsity sports are doing. Uh, but we also ask that, you know, you practice outside of the activity. Um, we always have like sectionals happening, you know, before practice or on an off day with our student leadership. But generally, like any instrument, you need to play it pretty consistently to uh, improve at it. And especially even with Color Guard, with it being, you know, new equipment to a lot of these members, it's something that, you know, the more you do it, the more times you rep it, um, the more comfortable you are. So other than our practice time, obviously, as much as you need outside. Fair point. Yep. So is marching band something that happens in or out of school? So marching band is an extracurricular activity. So it's pretty much 100% outside of school. I'm trying to think if there is. I know there are programs in the country that have like marching band classes. Like you go out to the Midwest or even Pennsylvania, there's like schools with a color guard class that you sign up for, like instead of gym. Um, Some schools concert band program is marching band. Uh, so, but mainly at least in the South or even in the state of New Jersey, um, marching band is generally an extracurricular after school activity. Okay. All right. So is there a cost at all to be in marching band? There isn't a upfront fee, um, to participate. There are a few things that, uh, families will have to purchase along the way. A couple of uniform parts like gloves and shoes and, you know, things that come up, um, Stuff that, are that for, you grow out of. Yeah. For, and yeah. things for yeah. personal use. Um, and we do require kids to participate in a number of our, um, booster fundraisers. So a lot of what we do within our program um, would not happen without the support of our um, parent booster organization. And, you know, part of the way that they help us achieve what we need to achieve in the season is by running a number of fundraisers, um, you know, that families can take a part of um, in, in different ways, whether that be, you know, selling things or helping out at different events, um, different ways to bring some income in to um, help, you know, support the program. And that offsets costs for all the students as well. Okay. So what are some of the challenges most of the kids face in marching band? I would say if you're new to it, um, time management can be a little bit overwhelming. You know, when you come back into school or you're starting high school for the Mm -hmm. first time and you're layering that in with a pretty intense fall rehearsal schedule. um, I see kids swim a little bit with that from time to time. Um, The physical element. Because a lot of a lot of the students we recruit are band kids. Um, there are, you know, there's, you know, in a school there's athletes, there's band kids, there's a couple mixes. But generally, a lot of these band kids that are signing up, uh, you know, the physical element can be a lot up front. They're like shocked that, they're like, wait, I'm coming to a band practice and I'm running laps. Like, <laughs> what, is, what is happening right now? Um, the physical element isn't too great. Like, anyone really can do it, um, but it is. It can be a shock you know, coming into the well, summer, you know, in all fairness, it is marching band, not standing band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you've time. mentioned yeah. that multiple times. Yeah. That'd be funny. <laughs> so how about stage fright? Do members experience it? <laughs> and how do you help members overcome stage fright? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know what? The whole thing can be really intense. Um, those first couple of performances where you've never done anything like that um, can absolutely be overwhelming. Um, So we always make sure that our first performance is a football game, which is kind of like our, you know, warm up performances in a way, like little dress rehearsals. Yeah. You definitely want a football game before your first competition. And I think um, a good way for kids to overcome that stage fright is to realize that, you know, you're operating as a unit, you know, you are a band, you are a whole group out there and, you know, very rarely are you 
um, even going to be able to be singled out. You know, you're dressed in uniform. You all, you know, look the same. It's hard to even say like, oh, is that Madison out there? Like, who is that? And I'm that, you know, um, so, you know, the fact that you're going out there with a group and you're a part of something, I think can kind of mitigate some of that stage fright. Cause you know, we're not asking you to, you know, step out and play a solo all by yourself. You know, a few mm-hmm. kids do, but you know, as a member, you can find, um, some peace in the fact that you're performing amongst many others. Totally. Uh, I think something else we did, we'll always do like a preview performance too with the parents to, you know, fill the stands with, with people that they know. Um, I know during rehearsal, uh, especially for like run throughs and stuff, we always like to get in people's faces to kind of freak them out a little bit. Uh, I think having your director stand two inches from you is scarier than, you know, a football audience. Um, but like Amanda was saying, like you have that power in numbers, but you also have, you know, power in preparation. Uh, the more prepared you are, the more times you do it, the easier it is. And you're just eventually you get to like the end of the season. And it's almost like like we talked about leading into it. Like this is your job. Like this is something you've been doing yeah. all season. You just go out there and you do your job and mm-hmm. you do it well. Um, and you try not to do anything more. You try not to overthink it. You don't make it anything bigger than what it is. Um, and that's led to some really successful performances, some really special moments. Um, and that's like a big thing for us. Yeah. The closest, the closest parallel I think I have was having been in choir. Um, you know, we would practice, we'd have two concerts a year. You never did more than two concerts a year. And when you went out there, you went out there with an entire audience. So you didn't get to ramp up to it. You didn't get the ease into it. You didn't know if it was a friendly audience and you only did it once. And then you did it, yeah. you know, four months later. Uh, so it could be kind of overwhelming sometimes. Definitely. So yeah, we, I can't even imagine our first performance being like ACCs. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that the thing. Room, but- you guys have played in front of some significantly large audiences this year. Uh, that is a really cool part. Yeah, that's. That's a big thing with marching band compared to, I know circling back to like, how's it different than other ensembles? Um, you do play in front of the biggest crowds. I mean, we've played, I mean, even just through the years, we've done parades in Washington, DC, where you just like, couldn't even see like where the people ended. Yeah. Um, we performed at MetLife stadium where the giants play to like a packed, like stands right in front of us. Like there's been some pretty wild mm-hmm. performance opportunities through marching band. That's crazy. Um, it's really cool. So we kind of touched on the benefits of marching band and, you know, we know a lot of it's not musical. What does marching band mean for the kids to join it? Uh, for a lot of kids, it's, I, I see it as an outlet for them. There's a lot of kids that do marching band that that's like their moment to kind of get away from all the stuff that's happening like in school and in their lives. Um, and they're able to see marching band as this escape from everything. Um, and being out there performing, like letting yourself go, um, is something really important for them and really get, got them through high school. Um, so that's really big. I mean, I, I had friends that had that, um, I always loved being a marching band students, just like, that's the really, that's the big thing for me that at least stands out, um, from kids. So it's yeah. a huge confidence builder moving yeah. through. That's and awesome. Community, your the best friends that you'll ever make are the, are the people that you did marching band with, you know, we have lifelong friends who, you know, will be close with forever. Um, you know, who we grew up performing with. Yeah. So we talked about the physical demands, you know, they're not overly demanding, but they're somewhat demanding. If you're uninitiated, what are some of the physical benefits that kids actually get from dealing with these demands? I mean, we get fit, <laughs> we get, you know, we, we focus fit. on, you know, flexibility and, you know, range of motion and, you know, endurance, you know, there's a lot of endurance involved with, you know, playing your instrument and executing, um, the physical and visual demands of the show. Um, so that's where a lot of that, you know, early summer training comes into place, you know, how much can you knock out, um, to be able to handle, you know, a, a seven, eight minute show in all conditions, um, you know, to meet the demands musically and and visually. Totally. Yeah. I mean, we already discussed how color guard, you know, is such a physical activity, Mm -hmm. Uh, the level of strength and coordination they need to do that is incredible. Um, but looking at the musicians, it's like, I'd like to challenge anyone like to jog for eight minutes straight, right? That's pretty easy. 
Uh, now try doing it with like a 40 inch bass drum on you yeah. <laughs> or now try jogging while just blowing out the entire time. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, there's like levels to it that, that definitely add to that, that physicality. Mm -hmm. um, and then as a musician, I think the physical, uh, the physical needs of a musician, like lung capacity support the muscles that you're developing. Um, I see it all the time, especially now that I'm at the middle school during the day, it's like the students that were in marching band and had that experience and played that much just take such a huge leap as musicians um, compared to the students that did not participate. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. That's interesting. Now you did touch a little bit about student leadership in the band itself. What does marching band do as far as teaching kids leadership? How does it help them with that? You want to start her? Yeah. I mean, it's, we've, we've mentioned in a, um, a couple of other prompts about, you know, the, the character and level of discipline that you, um, you know, build in your early years of marching band um, really enable some kids to thrive as, you know, student leaders. You know, there are so many kids, um, you know, who you can look up to because they march really well or because they play really well, but it's, it's the kids who start demanding that high level of, you know, personal character. Uh, we almost think of them as like mini staff members because they're just like mini extensions of us. You know what I mean? They have the same um, goals in mind for the program. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we entrust the student leadership to kind of um, instill the values uh, and like the traditions that we're building within, um, you know, our program, you know, and they're really what kind of keeps keeps everything alive. You know, they're the liaison between the staff and the, the student body. That's great. Yeah. I think that was spot on. Um, <laughs> just so like we mentioned earlier, the support system that student leadership does. Um, but one of the big things that we, we try to be like pretty hands off with student leadership. I mean, we want the upperclassmen to kind of create the identity of the program. Uh, we'll chat with them. We listen to them all the time, even when they don't think we're listening to them. Um, we hear what they're saying. Um, and I think, again, not to harp on this year, but I think the message that student leadership gave this year was awesome. Um, I was so impressed at our end of the year banquet um, that the student leadership, you know, speaks to the band. And the message that they gave was very consistent um, and correct. Like, it was just spot on, um, which is a really cool thing to see. Uh, but one of the big things that we deal with with student leadership, I'd say, is problem solving. Yeah. I think students will bring their problems to leadership way before they'll bring it to us, or they'll even like witness something going on way before we get involved. And a lot of times it's one of those situations where they're like, well, we don't want to know. We don't want them to know that we told you, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, so we have the opportunity to discuss with these students and work with them on how to problem solve and diffuse situations and work with students who are having issues with each other. Um, a lot of the time, obviously we do get involved if we notice that it's at a certain point that, you know, we need to kind of get in there, but, uh, it's such a cool thing for students to be able to, uh, work on, you know, talking out their problems and really listening to each other and, and handling things. That's great. That is great. You talk about, uh, uh, character and work ethic. I happened to be at practice at one point in time. Uh, I think it was when you Madison had lost her cell phone and there was uh, one of your drum majors had was off at soccer practice, got hurt and shows up at band practice with both of her knee, her knees uh, <laughs> taped up with ice on there. She's like, I can still, I can still direct. I can still direct. <laughs> like just to see that passion in there was just incredible. That energy. Uh, and, and it speaks volumes to the leadership that you guys provide. So that was, that was great. That really moved me when I saw that. <laughs> yeah, she's, there's, there's definitely some crazy ones. <laughs> yeah. and the student you're talking about is, is very special. She's awesome. <laughs> uh, there's a, definitely a bunch of kids like that. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, like we have, a, we had a student that had what double foot surgery over yeah. the, in the off season, like plan the surgery around marching band. <laughs> and then just like, literally like was in pain all season and just like had like a little, like when I got to a certain level, like he'd like pulled up like a, be like, I, I might have to sit like once. Yeah. But it oh, like bothered great. him so much that he even had to do that. Like yeah. there's, great. there's very passionate members. So I think, I, I think we can certainly make an argument for the benefits of marching band. Are there detriments? Like what kind of effect does it have on the kids grades? Do we keep an eye on that sort of thing? Um, I think, 
one of the big negatives I see is just, I guess maybe like the parental responsibility, like having to, you know, bring your kid to all these practices, all these events, um, basically not having a fall kind of is crazy to think about. Um, like when that competition season starts, we require, we need everyone there for every Saturday. Yeah. Um, I know no one's not going to be as committed as us. I mean, we've like missed weddings. We've missed like <laughs> births of children because of March <laughs> man. Um, but so is life. Uh, but I think that that level when that fall season comes around and the level of commitment that's required um, can definitely be challenging to a lot of people. Yeah, I could definitely see that. So where do you guys see kids? I mean, you've been doing this for enough years now that you've seen kids work through the program, graduate, go on to professional life. Do you see this affecting their professional life and providing career paths for them? Yeah, I think the, you know, experience in marching band uh, is not what's going to make you, you know, a symphony level, you know, professional position, uh, musician, but the, you know, the life skills that you take out of it most certainly will. Um, you know, I believe big in, you know, the way you do anything is the way that you do everything. And, you know, when we build that level of discipline and, you know, what it is to be committed and what it is to, you know, go full in, um, you know, that starts to show up in other parts of your life. There are things that you will learn in marching band that will absolutely, you know, stick with you for the rest of your life. That's awesome. So if you guys could give a sales pitch, a one line elevator pitch for why you should join marching band, what would it be? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even like, I don't know. One line sales pitch. I mean, it, it'll change your life. It will change your life. Yeah. <laughs> that's the pitch right there. I love it. <laughs> I don't think you need to add anything else to it. It'll change your life. And I think it, it definitely will. Sure, yeah. And I think that's a great place to stop. We'll take our second break and we'll be back to talk about the actual creative process. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. So this is the part of the show that we get into the nitty gritty and we break down those barriers and actually talk about how you actually go about creating things. So how do you go about selecting what program you're on and how far in advance do you typically start that process? You talked a little bit about it, but what's the real, the meat and potatoes behind it? Uh, definitely want to start after the season's done. Sometimes staff members are very like excited and they're like, the season's going well. They're like, I have an idea for next year's show. And I, I'm like, no, that cannot, that cannot happen. Yet. One year at a time. Yeah. Um, but generally uh, we'll, we'll start at the end of the season. We'll just start collecting ideas. Everyone on the staff is open to submitting some ideas. Um, and then one of the big things we look for is like who we have going into next year, um, who are our strong musicians, who are our strong performers, what are their strengths, um, and what's a show that can really bring that out. Uh, and then selfishly, it's kind of like what I'm feeling. Like if I'm not like feeling <laughs> a show, I'm not going to do it. So, uh, that's the beauty. That's the, the, the benefit of being a director, I guess. I get to make the final say on that one. That's great. So are there licensing challenges? So now I've sat through a number of the competitions and there's restrictions on what you can record and, and what you can't record and there's copyright issues. So when you guys go about putting a program together, do you have to purchase 
rights to certain music? Is there a pool of music that's available? How do you how do you manage that? Yeah, so there's definitely music licensing that you have to deal with. Um, generally, we try to get some music from public domain, which is just music that's old enough where the copyright has expired. Um, I think it's something like 75 years after the thanks, death. Of thanks the to Disney, because they were protecting Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yes. And that's one. Disney music is off, off limits for the most part. <laughs> John Williams, you can't really touch. I'm trying to think what else. Am I even allowed to say those names right now? <laughs> yeah, they're probably going to take my podcast down now because you said that. Beatles, yeah, some of them are just like really expensive. Like the Beatles used to be untouchable. And then this uh, drum corps a couple of years ago did a Beatles show, which was like, it was awesome. But I just was more in awe of how much money they must have spent on those arranging rights. Oh, yeah. Um, but generally, like to arrange a piece of music, it's going to cost you anywhere between like two hundred and a thousand dollars, depending on how popular it is. If you're doing some more modern music, that's gonna that's gonna put you back um, some money. So that definitely goes into the design process. Sadly, um, I've been bitten before where I jumped the gun and arranged the song, and then I was like, "Oh, this band did it last year," and then I got denied arranging rights. And I had to rewrite it so it didn't really sound like the song, but <laughs> kind of still was. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's an interesting road. So can you talk a bit about the crew and other instructors who are part of the process and their involvement? There's a lot of there's a lot of talent within our staff. Um, you know, it is certainly not a job that can be done by one or even two people. Um, you know, we have to have people who are specialized in color guard specifically and drum line specifically, even front ensemble, which is very different than the drum line, even though they're both percussion. Um, you know, like we mentioned, he'll focus on the music element of things, but keep in mind, that's only like the horns. If we wanted to get more specifically, he's a woodwind player. So we need a brass person. And it's like, you need to find people who can specialize, um, and serve, you know, the student body. So um and complement our skills yeah, yeah yeah absolutely um so they all have you know a really important role and you know there's a hierarchy in this within the staff about how things you know get decided um but like he mentioned earlier as far as it as far as theming goes you know we're we're always open to you know different ideas and we really respect um the experience um from a lot of our staff members and what they have um to offer really from design instruction, you know, we let, we let them do what they want to do. Oh yeah. Definitely give them that creative freedom. Um, that's why we're bringing them on. They are the experts of their field. Uh, I always will ask questions. I'll ask, you know, what their process was and why they're doing what they're doing. But for the most part, I, I mean, we hire these people, so we should trust what they're doing. Um, one of the big things I look for in staff members is their like calmness. That's like my, because I get a little crazy. Addison knows. I get, <laughs> I get a little off my rocker sometimes. So I need like yeah, a staff yeah. that can like mellow me out a bit. That's always a nice thing. Some control rods in that reactor. Exactly. <laughs> so are there specific elements you look to include in your performance that are required for competitions? Um, there are certain restrictions within circuits as far as how long your performance has to be, um, you can't be out there for, you know, more than 15 minutes, you know, dragging your props and equipment off the field. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there are things that you can incur penalties for, um, if you don't stay within. Um, but as far as, you know, the creative process, the way I kind of think of it, at least from a visual standpoint is there's like a little checklist, you know, of things that you want to hit, you know, um, are we using dynamic movement versus static movement? Are there levels? How are we, you know, showing what we're hearing, you know, things like that, that I'm constantly running through as the visual designer. Um, you know, I say checking the boxes to make sure the judges like it. Um, but I wouldn't say that those elements are necessarily required just if you want to, you know, be competitive. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'll just say for like a musical standpoint and overall, I think, um, when you're going into, you know, the elements of a performance, you want to have moments, you want to have impacts. Um, so you kind of start there. You want to have these, where do we want our huge, like, whoa, or wow moments. Um, and then how do you get there? How do you develop that? Um, and then how do you move on from it? Uh, something that I always like to do musically as well as from an educational standpoint is 
I'm looking at the kids throughout the year. I'm like, okay, what do we need to work on this year musically? Like, are we struggling with articulations this year? Are we struggling with coming in on like strange beats or, or strange entrances? Um, and generally I like to sneak some of that. It's kind of like sneaking like your vegetables into mac and cheese <laughs> or something like sneak that in there. Um, so they're getting stronger at the things that they need to get stronger at. Um, and then making sure that they're getting the credit. This is kind of like, you know, what the, what the, you know, circuit's looking for, um, making sure the students are getting the credit for the difficulty that they're doing. So, um, a lot of times like young designers, uh, like, especially when we were early in our careers, we'd put these like crazy shows together. Um, and so much stuff would get lost, um, and be like, well, the kids are doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this, and you're not noticing it. And you realize these judges have one moment to just see everything. Yeah. Um, so you kind of want to make your wild moments like in your face, like these kids are doing something crazy right here. Check it out. Um, and that's, that takes a lot of finesse. That takes a lot of coordination. It's not easy to do. Um, and it's something we're still continuing to develop. But, well, and to that point, I can, I can say from, from doing the videos from the very beginning throughout the season and seeing how the show evolved, those points came out very obviously from midway in the season and on where when I was, you know, I tried to do a multi-camera approach and I look for transition points and those gotchas are the transition points and they started popping up more and more frequently as the season went on. So it, it gave the show a much more dynamic feel by the end of the season. Yeah. So, yeah. If you look closely, I mean, week to week from show to show, it's never exactly the same, you know, you achieve a point of cleanliness and like, here are our staple moments. Here is the drill. This is the basic, you know, set up. But then, you know, when we dig further and further into the theme, you know, we're adding little visuals left and right. You know, the color of guard becomes, you know, a little bit more dynamic um, and expressive. And, you know, mm -hmm. the when the props get layered in and things like that, you know, the, the show itself is never really done. Yeah. You know, it, it, change, it changes. It's still stuff the we could have added to the show. Yeah. And, and that was what I noticed. Every show was slightly different. Like it was, it was almost like an organism that was evolving and growing yeah. up throughout the whole season. And it made it very it. interesting to see every every performance like that. Yeah. It's cool. So, it's also cool. I love it sometimes when like a kid will just do something like on the field and it wouldn't be like a planned thing we wanted to add or do. And I'm just like, wow, I like that. And we just like, <laughs> yeah. So the kids probably don't even realize it, but they even play a part in the design process through the season. Yeah. Madison's going to be like secretly doing it. <laughs> um, so how do you digest the input from the judges and relay that and then actionable actionable form to the band to make corrections? You could tell I wrote the scripts. You didn't write the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> so the judge input, I ignore all of it. <laughs> I would say you take it with a grain of salt. Um, they're, you know, they are experienced in their field. Um, you know, different judges come from different generations of marching band this activity is not the same as it was even 10 five 10 years ago and it's it's constantly evolving you know what is new what is modern um and depending on their experience and where they came from and their background we you know may or may not agree with the the feedback that they give yeah. you know what i mean you want to respect as many um you know reads on the show it's great to get eyes on the show and get that feedback and sometimes we're like yeah yeah they're absolutely right and other times we're like mm, i don't <laughs> I don't think you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it depends who it is too. Yeah. Um, like when we were at our old school, we would do competitions where some of like the top drum corps instructors were judging us. Um, and I just remember, I remember sitting down with the cadets horn line instructor and he's telling me something and it's literally the opposite of what I was doing. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, wait, am I an idiot or is he an idiot? Like what? And I completely changed my approach and it was so positive. Um, so you definitely do have to take everything in some way into account, but um, you can't, like Amanda said, you can't take it like, like everything completely 100% seriously. Or you, you'll be changing your entire show every single yeah. week. Well, I had the unique experience at the home show to be sitting up right at the booth and I had the one judge in my one ear and I got to listen to him critique each and every show. And it was interesting because he was incredibly consistent in his critique of, of what he was doing. I think it was the visuals judge. Then I had a judge on the other side 
And the same thing could happen five times on the field, and he'd call it a different way each time. And I'm like, that's very confusing to me. I don't know how he's saying <laughs> well, it, that. But, it can be. It can be. Um, There's sometimes we've had judges where we'd be had a judges meeting, which would take place like after the show. And this guy will give his big spiel and we'll then go to the next table and I'll listen and he'll say the same exact thing the to next the next fan. I'm just like, <laughs> I was like, come on, dude. <laughs> Dug that script back out and read it again. I know, yeah. <laughs> but there really are. There are some excellent yeah. judges. Like we got fortunate. Um, like I remember this past year, the music judge happened to see us at our home show chapters and ACCs. And he recognized, he was like calling out moments that he called out the week before and recognize the, you know, the level of quality that we got to and it was really on top of things. And there's judges like that, that you're just like really, you know, fortunate that they're in your circuit and they're, yeah. you know, they're the ones that kind of are in your, your fate is in their hands basically. Yeah. yeah. Let's take a kind of a, a sidestep here. Let's talk about, we, we, we gave credit to our, our student leadership already, but what goes into choosing the student leadership? What qualities do you look for? Is it a new leadership every year? How does that evolve? Well, it starts their first day of marching band. So <laughs> it, really, it really does. I mean, we do a full, you know, interview process, audition process um, every single year. So even if you were a drum major this past season, you have to reapply. Um, but it, it's we watch everything. We see everything. We hear everything. Um, you could come in and tell us that you're the most wonderful person in the world, but we've watched you every single <laughs> rehearsal and maybe you're telling the truth, maybe not. Um, so the interview process does take into account, but we're always looking for student leaders. Um, and we tell the kids, even if you don't have a leadership title, you can still be a leader on that field. So, yeah. um, there's kids that kind of, I'd say, force us to make them leaders. It doesn't even <laughs> give us an option to choose. That's great. So what about the support that the band gets? We talked about the, the, the band parent association and how about the school? Does the school, do you feel the school supports the band sufficiently? Totally. I think we have an excellent, like as far as administration goes, athletic director administration. Um, it's so cool. Cause I've been in situations where it has not been as supportive. <laughs> yeah. So it's really nice to be in uh, this district. Uh, there's, Teachers always coming up to me like after a competition saying like, Oh, we heard you did well, all this stuff. So um, obviously it's out in the community. Um, it's a very supportive arts community, Deptford. So um, it's just really nice to have that support. That's something that kind of drew me to this position. Uh, definitely. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really nice situation here. They have to be supportive. I mean, they made that beautiful field for you guys that you let the football team play. <laughs> I know, right? The marching band field. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's been awesome. I mean, getting to rehearse on that new turf field, um, every basically every single practice makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, Madison got to experience our parking lot a couple times. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately. It's, it's, like, it's a slight downgrade, I'd say, from the, uh, the turf stadium. Well, that's great. I think we're all looking forward to next year's... Uh, season and mm -hmm. I'm certainly looking forward to it. I, I didn't think I would be, I'll be honest with you. I was, <laughs> I, well, I was very overwhelmed early on at the, at the time demands and, and, and just what was, you know, expected of the parents, but you see the end product. And, and after you see that, there's a, there's a level of pride even that I have in, in the, what limited I've committed to it and seeing how she's evolved throughout the whole time and what she's learned and become. And, at the end of the whole thing, it's, it's worth it. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't endorse it more strongly than I, than I can at this point. So, That's and really great to hear. yeah, appreciate it. And you guys uh -huh. have done a fantastic job and the kids look up to you guys. They, they, I didn't hear a negative word about any of the staff you know, from, from my daughter or anybody else that I had interacted with. And I think that's uh -huh. a great. You're hanging with the right people. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that was all we had. Did you have any other questions that you wanted to throw out there? Um, I guess all I really have to say is, do you think we did good this year? Yes. Yeah. I would have to say generally Amanda knows at the end of a marching band season, I go into, I like to go into hibernation usually <laughs> where I don't want anyone to talk to me about marching band for at least a month. <laughs> and for like, sometimes this happens, but this year I was right. I'm like, this 
day after ACCs, I was ready to go for next year. So that's great. awesome season. Um, Is there any message that you guys want to leave us with before we go? Amanda, you'd leave the great message. I don't so. know if I have because you had that great one-liner. You know, for for the sake of this, you know, being informative, um, you know, and if this could reach, you know, any audience and, you know, inform anybody about the activity, um, you know, I encourage you to, you know, give it a try. It's certainly something out of, you know, many people's comfort zone. It's a, it's a weird thing to get involved in. But it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, and you know, there's so much that you can take from it. Um, you know, you'll grow and you become a better person. That's great that you're right. That is a great message to lead the kids with. She's good. She, she is good. <laughs> yep. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come right back. We'll get Madison's closing thoughts and then we'll finish up with uh show plugs and go from there. We'll be right back. Go with your closing thoughts. Okay, so to everyone out there, I just want to kind of mention that, yeah, marching band has a lot of benefits. I've certainly benefited a lot from it. There are definitely ups and downs to it. I've experienced both. Um, And, you know, going into it, I really was that kind of scared person. I thought that there was a lot being expected of me. There was a lot of anxiety going into it at first, but... Once you realize that you start getting those really good performances and you hear how the instructors, like, how proud the instructors are of you, how much you've improved, and you can just, it, it just, it just ultimately makes it worth it in the end just to see how much you've improved and overall I can't recommend the feeling enough. Okay. That was, that was very well said. I want to thank our, our guests, John and Amanda. You guys were great. I appreciate all the time you gave us tonight. Thanks for having us. Uh, we'll have this probably posted up on Monday for you guys to see if you want to go back and see how bad we flubbed our lines on this <laughs> side here. <laughs> but, uh, we're, we're ready to go for our next season of marching band. I hope you guys get a good turnout with uh, students as well. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time. Before we do go, I did want to invite our listening and uh, viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of all the network podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things or available anywhere you can get a podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, etc. I would also encourage you to write in, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram. We're at instagram.com slash insights into things, or you can get all that and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>